Hi, I'm Kat Powers, and we are talking with Adrian Pomeroy, who is the city of Somerville's Americans with Disabilities Act Coordinator. Thank you. Welcome to the SCAT building. Thank you so much, Kat. So what is, what is your job? What is, what is the, let's start with, what is the American uh, Disabilities Act? Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act is a piece of federal legislation that was put into place by George Bush Sr. in the early 90s to finally uh, put into place federal protections for those who identify with a disability. Um, this is not only physical access to things, you know, walking around, trying to access buildings, uh, including, most importantly, public buildings, uh, but program access as well. Um, you know, not everybody can attend a meeting in person. Not everybody uh, can read a font at the standard 12 point. Um, so it really finally put into fact provisions that one, help define disability, and then two, help folks uh, who may identify as having disabilities uh, get the human rights that they are entitled to as humans to be active within. Uh, our country. Um, and as part of that, it is a requirement that cities like Somerville uh, comply with Titles I and Titles II of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which Title I is uh, employment. Uh, so employment protections, uh, reasonable accommodations to be able to perform functions of a job. And then Title II, as I mentioned, is program and physical access to things. So your department is within the department is or your your role is within the department of racial and social justice at city hall now this is this is kind of unusual for an ada coordinator yeah um i don't think it's unusual um i can see why um some folks would think it's that way but the way we look at it in the department of racial and social justice is that you cannot have an active intentional and um, program around diversity and inclusion if you are not including persons with disabilities. Also, there are not a lot of racial and social justice departments around the country. Yeah, last I checked, I believe we are one of three in the entire country. Wow. All right. So you're one of three so and do they each have do do they do they all function differently is it unusual to put ada coordination underneath this role um i do not think it's unusual yeah. um what you will find in other even within the commonwealth of massachusetts is as other municipalities are building these diversity and inclusion programs um they are working hand in hand with their ADA coordinators, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, in some municipalities, you have folks who have a main key job with the city, say the director of inspectional services, and they are also acting as the ADA coordinator. Mm -hmm. uh, the city of Somerville is very fortunate. I am not the first, but we are very fortunate where we have somebody who is solely within the ADA coordinator role. So that is my primary responsibility. So how did you... How, how did you become an ADA coordinator? Is Do you go to school for this sort of thing? <laughs> um, how I became an ADA coordinator, there are many pathways, is that um, in a former life, I was an elementary school teacher in North Carolina. Um, and then I started to really see the gaps and disparities, uh, not only for students who had disabilities, but all students uh, within the public school system. And I said, you know, what can I, I, I don't feel like I'm doing enough you know, as a teacher, somebody in the trenches, somebody who is day in day working with the students, what can I do? Uh, so I made a really big leap of faith and ended up in the Masters of Public Policy program at Simmons College. It is now Simmons University. Um, and during that time, I served as an ABA specialist for Boston Public Schools. ABA? Yes. What Applied is Behavior Analysis, okay. which is an intervention that is sometimes used for 
uh, students on the autism spectrum um, to help with routine and scheduling um, and sort of setting them up for success within the school day. So I served Boston Public Schools in that capacity for two years while going to graduate school at night. Um, and that's when I really started to focus my research and my final capstone project in really looking at the disparities on what students with disabilities are facing and, you know, in the public school system um, and sort of advocating for families and people who work within the school system to serve these students. Um, and so I focused on that and sort of the retention. And then I said, well, I want to keep doing this. Um, I left Boston for a little bit and did some other things and then was able to come back in early 2020 and work in operations for a great self-advocacy organization in the state called Massachusetts Advocates Standing Strong um, and did their operations for almost two years at the height of the global pandemic around COVID. Um, and then in late summer of 2021, I saw that this had become available and it felt like the right next step to be able to really take it to the next level of serving uh, the great city of Somerville for whom I've almost been a resident for three years now, um, and really making sure we're doing everything we can to be compliant with the ADA. Is this a personal passion for you? Definitely. Um, why I am not somebody with lived experience, I don't identify as having a disability. Um, I have aging parents. Um, my mother in particular is aging in place in assisted living in Ohio and has been in a wheelchair for many years due to lack of mobility. And she herself identifies as disabled. Um, so really having a personal passion about navigating her through uh, benefits, Medicaid benefits, um, getting her the equipment she needs, getting what she needs to you know, function and have a high quality of life. Um, and you know, so far so good. Um, and doing that from almost you know, 900, you know, thousand miles away uh, can be quite challenging, but she's turning 80 in June. So uh, we're really all excited about that. So yeah, a personal passion that uh, the world is there for everybody and thus it should be accessible for everybody. All right, let's talk about language. So we are all about access here. We're an access station. Yeah. Um, we have um, members bringing in giant pieces of equipment, putting it in their cars and, you know, hogging the handicap uh, spots. And, you know, it, even if they don't have a handicap placard, I'm using problematic language, aren't I? Uh, now you are. So uh, the word handicapped or even still using handicapped parking spot mm -hmm. is handicapped is an antiquated term. Uh, it is not used anymore. It is not advised to be used anymore. We prefer the word accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, what my mother prefers. Um, and so I am actually, you know, continuing to work with my colleagues within the city to change our internal dialogues mm -hmm. around that piece of language. Um, I also am the staff liaison for the Somerville Commission for Persons with Disabilities. Um, and we have conversations about that with well as well. And what that takes is just little bits of education with folks. Um, a lot of what this job entails is just educating other folks because they don't know. Right. Um, as old as the ADA is, um, you know, a lot of people don't have the education around it. And that's part of the reason why I exist. So I hope while we're talking that you call me in and correct my language on the fly. Sure. Totally okay with that. I'd prefer to learn, as I'm sure all of Somerville would. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, some of the issues that are facing Somerville, um, I know that, you know, when the ADA came in, that meant that a person uh, like me who... Uh, would happily push a stroller up a curb, it is so much easier to do so when there is an actual uh, accessible ramp to get up onto the sidewalk. I corrected myself. <laughs> there is an actual accessible ramp to get up to the sidewalk with that stroller, which also works when somebody is in a wheelchair. Correct. Um, or uh, So what are some of the issues that we are still facing in Somerville? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, Somerville is known 
Uh, for the fact that it's so historical, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we are nearing the 200 year old mark. Um, you know, Patriots Day is not just for Boston, it's for us too. Um, and so what that comes with is really old infrastructure. Um, you know, neighborhoods in Somerville, um, as you and I talked about earlier, are named after hills. Mm -hmm. We are very uh, slopey. That's not a real word. I just made it up. Yeah, we are slopey. We are a slopey community. And so what that comes with is not only challenges for those who use mobility devices such as wheelchairs, uh, walkers, canes, et cetera, but families who have strollers. Um, and so I work nearly every day with our engineering and mobility departments to see where the gaps are and how we can fix those and really make Somerville a safe place, not only for those who are using mobility devices, but pedestrians, uh, people who drive, and then people who use bike. And especially we see a lot of families who use bikes that are carrying children mm -hmm. in the back of them. Um, and so... Really, it's a collaborative. I don't exist alone uh, in racial and social justice. We say no man is an island. Uh, I not only work with my department, but I work with numerous city departments uh, to really make those improvements because uh, we all get feedback from constituents. And then we all can have sort of this meeting of the minds and decide the best course forward and having accessibility at the forefront instead of an afterthought. So more on that, but the uh, more on that a little bit later. But uh, the issues facing Somerville in particular, I know that our trees have become a thing. We have some streets where these beautiful old trees have uprooted the entire sidewalk. There is no walking by it, much less getting a sure. stroller or a motorized chair. Sure. I, it, and I am not gonna be the anti-tree person here in Somerville. <laughs> we, we have been a tree city for uh, several mayors now. Yes. So where, how, how do we fix that? Are we going to pave sidewalks so that they go around trees and then remove parking for some folks who might not be as able as I and need that car? I, how, how do we how do we make this work? Again, it goes back to that collaborative effort. Um, there are models out there where you can create a sidewalk around a tree that mm -hmm. has really very much aged in place so forth that it okay, yeah, yeah. That that's it, a good way to put it yeah as very much you know uprooted mm -hmm. the cement that was put in there many many years ago mm -hmm. so that's one way to look at it uh thinking about alternative spots for parking thinking about ways that we can decrease that sloping uh most of the time that is uh sometimes doesn't work just given the natural you know uh you know topography that we have here in Somerville. Mm -hmm. But again, it's that collaborative effort of what can we do? Because uh, sometimes moving the tree is not the option. And that um, I am in many conversations with my colleagues in public space and urban forestry uh, on a weekly basis. And it's very hard to remove trees, especially ones that have aged in place so much. Um, and as you said, we love our trees in Somerville. Uh, so if we do end up having to make that really hard decision to move a tree or get rid of a tree, we're going to find another place for a tree because we love our trees in Somerville. So we have so many people packed into 4.1 square miles. We're all it just Somerville is defined by its fight for resources, yeah. you know, parking spaces versus biking versus uh, where do you put the curb cut so that you can get the ramp up onto the sidewalk where you have your work cut out for you. Yeah. So um, you're actually talking about putting out a survey to figure out what, what does the survey do? Is, is this like a is this going to be a punch list for you? What is what is the yeah. survey to accomplish? Great. Great. Yeah. So the ADA community survey is out now. It's been out for a little bit. And what we're seeking um, from folks is to. Give them an opportunity to really um, tell us their story of how they are accessing or maybe not accessing uh, parts of our community mm -hmm. and where the gaps are. 
Um, we are on the ground on a weekly basis looking at things and figuring things out. Uh, but we are a small group of people. There are over 6,000 people based on the U.S. Census that identify as a person with a disability within the city of Somerville, within that small square mileage radius. So the survey is for them to let us know uh, maybe, you know, what we haven't seen yet or what we haven't heard more about. Or, you know, we have all this new development coming up in Somerville. You know, we have Assembly Square. We have what is happening right here in Union. Um, and sometimes, even if it's new, it may be missing something. And so... So when you're, when you're building new... Yeah. We're building, we're building not to the 1700s codes. Correct. We're building to today's standards where we all understand that... Folks need to come in with chairs or canes or strollers. Yeah, so and it's not just about coming into those buildings, these beautiful buildings that are going up around mm -hmm. Somerville. It's about accessing the public space. That's a part of that development. It's about getting around that building to get somewhere else. All of it needs to be accessible. Uh, and myself and colleagues are very adamant about that when we're even in the beginning stages, which is our zoning meetings, you know, reminding developers about what the requirements are and also presenting opportunities to go above and beyond where they can. Um, you know, public spaces are so important in our community because they're for the public. Uh, the public spaces that, you know, we see around uh, the Mass Brigham building and Assembly Square, that's public space. You don't have to be accessing that building uh, for a need to use that public space. It is there for the residents and it is, you know, accessible. And that's the same thing we require of all our developments coming into Somerville. Um, and these, and sometimes they're very difficult conversations, but they're one reminders and then two that, you know, these spaces need to be accessible for all. So maybe uh, these developers want to think about sort of uh, more sidewalks, you know, that are wide enough to take wheelchairs instead of putting in a set of pretty stairs because it looks better. Mm. Because uh, stairs are challenging for a lot of people. I'm, I'm sure you have success stories, but at, but this is this is probably something you are facing throughout the city. There's we're we're seeing change that we haven't seen at a scale for generations in Somerville, where it, developments are just popping up all over the place. Are there unique challenges? to different developments for making them accessible? I wouldn't say they're in neat challenges mm -hmm. because the requirements are there and they're very clear. Okay. Um, and, you know, myself, not only myself, but my colleagues remind them of that, uh, especially when it comes to public space. Um, if you actually are a landscape architect, which several members of our public safety public space and urban forestry team, team are mm -hmm. landscape architects by trade. Uh, there are ADA related questions on that examination for the Commonwealth and you have to pass all of them to get your licensure. Um, so when it that's kind of a relief, actually. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's great. So those public spaces are expected to be accessible mm -hmm. uh, for all. And they're expected to, you know, be welcoming to everybody mm -hmm. who is in our city. Um, so I wouldn't say it's a challenge. It's just sort of about reminders and accountability. So you've got a survey out. Yep. Uh, how long is it out for? It will be out till the end of June. Uh, okay. So almost a little over almost uh, eight weeks now. Um, I'm really excited to be doing some language focus groups. I've been working with our great team over at the Somerville or at the Department for Immigrant Affairs, SOIA, um, to get some focus groups in other languages because um, there's diversity there in Somerville. We know that. Um, and then the community meetings, as I'm sure you all have heard, are starting this week with Mayor Ballantyne and City Council. Uh, so I will be at all of those community meetings uh, talking about the survey and engaging with folks because we want to hear from as many people as possible over this next eight week period. Um, and even if there's somebody who may not identify, even if there's somebody who's not in the place yet where they're taking care of uh, 
another family member who may be aging in place or who is disabled, you know, we want to hear about from their perspective, or maybe they've talked with their neighbors or other family members who live there about what they're seeing. Um, and then also it's a great opportunity for them just to share their stories with me. Um, I think the best way to engage with people is that is sharing stories and sharing commonality, you know, about making things more accessible. And there's space for that on the survey. Um, everything is priority, but we want to know about what the public's priority is because they are engaging with Somerville, you know, 365, 24 hours a day. So uh, folks who identify as having a disability, I hope I'm saying this correctly, folks who identify as having a disability, folks who are um, uh, working with or ha who have knowledge of those who are working with a disability, do you want regular folk to of weigh course. in? Of course, because they are also, you know, engaging with our community. They also may have a neighbor mm -hmm. uh, who they may have conversations with. Um, and they also may be in a really great place of privilege where they can help share information where somebody otherwise can't. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the biggest thing we have to remember here, that we all carry, you know, a lot of us carry privilege mm. to help with advocacy and getting the word out. So we do want to hear it from as many people as possible. I'm looking forward to engaging with folks at these community meetings uh, starting tomorrow evening. Um, and if folks cannot access the survey online, uh, they are more than welcome to contact me and I can talk to them on the phone or we can get them a different type of the survey in a different format so they can complete it. Fantastic. All right. So um, anybody in Somerville yes. can answer the survey. Yeah. Um, anybody can get the survey online uh, over the phone. You can get a paper version of the yeah. survey. You're looking to make this as accessible as possible, including in different languages. Yes. And we're, we're talking about the target languages here in Somerville, yeah. English, Spanish, Haitian, Creole, Nepali, Portuguese. Port okay. Uh, and then traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese in the written form. Mm -hmm. And then the sessions, of course, would be the live sessions would be in Cantonese mm -hmm. and Mandarin. Um, and then, you know, also engaging with folks who may work in Somerville, who may identify. Maybe they live in Boston. Maybe they live in Cambridge. Maybe they live, you know, in Medford or Melrose or somewhere. Um, but they come into Somerville to work. We want to hear from those folks as well. So when you get all of this information, uh, this, um, how are you going to go through and prioritize it? Great question. So the city currently has a working live ADA transition plan, mm -hmm. uh, which is something cities were supposed to start doing soon after the ADA was enacted and sort of a long term plan about how are you going to go from point A, whatever that looks like for you with levels of accessibility and become more accessible. Uh, that plan is around 10 years old at this point and is due for an evaluation. Uh, so this information, one, will, will really help inform the evaluation of that plan, see where we are, uh, see the things that we can report on that have been done and see where we need to go over the next decade. And does that mean... Um are you, do you think you're going to be looking at physical infrastructure? Is this arming the mayor to lobby the state house for uh, legislation? I mean, wh where where so does this go? All of it. So we're going to be looking at physical. We're always looking at physical access and infrastructure. Even more importantly, uh, we're looking at program access. So we know that due to the pandemic, that all meetings were moved online. Um, but that brings it and why that makes it more accessible for most folks. Uh, we have to think about closed captioning. We have to think about other types of interpreting. We have to think about technology access to be able to access a Zoom link or whatever link we are using. Um, and, you know, the city, due to temporary uh, Commonwealth legislation, has been able to have those meetings online. Uh, city council has gone back to hybrid mode, so you are more than welcome to attend in person. You can still attend online. Um, but I believe that that has now been extended, where cities do have to offer an online meeting because it has proven to be more accessible to folks. And there, as we've learned as a result of the pandemic, um, 
a lot of us are immune compromised, uh, regardless of if we identify or not. So it's not safe from a health perspective for us to be in a public building attending a meeting. <laughs> right. So um, that does actually bring up, you know, what is what is the, what are the disabilities we're talking about? You know, because I mean, I can talk about like you know, bike lanes work great for motorized wheelchairs. I don't know if that's actually legal, but that's where I see folks with motorized wheelchairs, you know, zipping along that, you know, in the bike line. Um, are when we're talking about disabilities, are we talking about um are we talking about mental health and being immunocompromised? And are, yeah, we're talking about it all. So, you know, we often are in a point where we only want to talk about the disabilities we can see. Mm. But the fact is, there are many folks out there who have disabilities that can't be seen. Um, and you will not know that unless they choose to tell you or they give you some information indicating that. Um, so this is for everybody because there are so many unseen disabilities, invisible disabilities. Um, and we know now that, um, you know, being diagnosed with something within the mental health uh, field can also be debilitating. You know, if you have high enough in anxiety, you may not be able to function at your job sometimes, depending on what's going on um, and what resources are out for that. And that's another reason to have the survey out is that we want folks to know that there is an ADA division and there's somebody out there that can provide resources because sometimes you don't know or you weren't given correct information or maybe your family is trying to help but they may not live in Massachusetts, so they don't know. Mm, gotcha. All right, so let's project out like 10, 20 years. Um, you've worked here as the ADA coordinator in Somerville. You've uh, seen improvements, you've seen changes. What do you think is gonna be your long-term legacy? Um, I just want the city to continue to feel accessible. I want it to continue to be inclusive. I want it to continue to be a place where people want to come and raise their families or support their parents or grandparents who wish to stay here in Asian place. Um, I've gotten the privilege of engaging with all types of folks uh, so far in this role, um, but our aging in place population is a wonderful population because they have been here their whole entire lives. You know, they went to Somerville High School before it is the high school that we know they now. They went to the junior high school. They went to the junior <laughs> high school. Um, they, they know every neighborhood like the back of their hand because they had to walk through it, um, you know. And so, you know, I want folks to feel like they can stay here because Somerville is their life, is the core of who they are because they were born and raised here. or Maybe they came here when they were younger. I want our high school students and their families to feel like they can stay there, even if they branch out and go do amazing things in other parts of the world, that their home base will always be Somerville because it's accessible, it's inclusive, and there's room for everybody. I want our business owners, um, especially those where English is not their first language, you know, to be uh, well versed in the things they need accessibility wise to be able to run their businesses and make those accessible because uh, the culture there is a huge part of our footprint and I think really makes Somerville what it is and very unique compared to a lot of municipalities that surround us. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I thank you very much for thank coming. Thank you. Up. And I have to say, I'm Cat Powers here in the Scat Building, here with Adrian Pomeroy. Thank you very much for watching. And we're just going to hang out here for a second until Nick says we're okay. <laughs> we're okay. Fantastic. All right. Awesome. <laughs>